Welcome everybody. Welcome to the first in our new series of Open Studios. Um, can I just introduce our chairperson for tonight, uh, Kate Downey, RSE. Welcome, Kate. Thank you, Sheena. It's lovely to see you and thanks for helping to set this up. Um, this is our first of our live Open Studio events for the RSA annual exhibition. And I'm delighted to welcome um, in order of appearance, uh, Joanna Kessel um, and Jenny Pope, Duncan Robertson and Stephen Skrinka. Um, welcome to all of you. Um, all four of you have had work accepted into the annual exhibition. And for those of you who hung out on the internet on Friday night, it was really as, fun, as much fun, I figure, as we could have at a private view that was also a virtual event. However, this event will be no less lively and we're going to visit um, four of the studios of the, these four exhibiting artists. And without further ado, I would be delighted to welcome Joanna Kessel, who is based in Edinburgh and is, a, would it be okay to call you a mosaic artist? I think that doesn't really cover it, does it, Joe? No, well, I tend to call myself a visual artist who specializes in contemporary mosaic. That sounds um, much better. <laughs> yeah. But um, anyway, we don't like to be pigeonholed too much, do Absolutely. we? Absolutely, no. Uh, just a few words about, I've known Joe for a long time, over 20 years, and I absolutely loved her work all the way. Um, jo has been studying, um, and I'm sure she'll talk a lot more about that, uh, in Italy and doing residencies in Italy. And the, the mosaic tradition there um, is absolutely extraordinary. And there's been some exciting cross fertilization with her work and the Italian architecture, which she'll talk more about. Um, the piece of work that she has in the annual exhibition was first seen in Collect um, open in the Saatchi Gallery in 2019. That's right. Yeah. Without further ado, I welcome Joe Kessel. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Well, welcome everybody to the studio. It feels somewhat novel to have people uh, come in, even though virtually. Um, it's been a long time since we've been able to um, have open studios. Um, Anyway, I've got the evening sunlight comes round, so I'm hoping that the work on the wall behind me, which um, I use a lot of gold leaf, that we might actually, before the end of the evening, get some sunlight landing on it, which always oh. feels a very nice time to be here. Fantastic. Um, I'm just going to start by hopefully sharing my screen successfully to show you the piece of work that is in um, the RSA annual. Um, so that people who don't know my work will know what I'm talking about. So I'm just going to try that now. So um, this is um, what I term an architectural mosaic. So the scale of it is 150 centimetres high. So you can obviously see that I'm standing there in the photograph, which gives a sense of scale. Um, and then I've put a close up detail um, in um, because each individual tessera is cut by hand and then applied into a pigmented um, cement adhesive. So it's a very um, time consuming um, and exacting process um, uh, applying the, the mosaic. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I just wanted to show that piece to give you an idea of both the scale of the unit that goes to make up the mosaic, but also the scale of the piece. Um, and the great thing for me, this is the sister piece, um, which huh. I was also in Collect Open. And Collect Open gave me the forum to, to make these two pieces because it was such a big commitment for me to make them that I needed to know that they were going to be shown somewhere as opposed to making them in the studio and them, them sitting course, there. Yeah. Um, and so this also incorporates gold leaf mosaic, which you can see 
well, both in both images, but in the detail very easily. Mm -hmm. But it's also um, encapsulated within pigmented jesmonite, which is a polymer concrete. It's absolutely beautiful, Joe. I so wish I could just be there and I want my hand to stroke that, that surface of it. it. It's a really velvety, mm. alluring Gorgeous. surface. So, okay, I'm just going to stop. Hopefully that will go back to me. Yeah. Yep. So that's, that's well done. <laughs> um, so I'm just now going to hopefully very slowly so that I don't make everyone feel seasick, just give you, show you my studio a little bit. Definitely so want to nosy. Yeah. Yeah. Take you on a little tour and, um, and then just talk about the materials. So the important things behind my work, obviously the concept, the idea behind the work, but the materials are really, well, they sit beside the, the concept. So uh, they may be not central, but they're of equal importance, but so also is the process and the time it takes to make the work. So it's a really immersive process. Um, and you'll see the size of the tesserae. Um, yeah. So it's, it, there's something about stitch and um, placement. Anyway, let me just try and get you past the more chaotic aspects of the studio. So storage is a big thing. I like to have materials at hand. Um, <coughs> I find it really useful to be able to pick up the actual material that I'm going to use uh, and to be able to play around with that um, directly. So that's very important. It's not just about designing something and um, having a color um, and replicating it. So I'm just going to show you a few things on my table. Does that look okay? Is that? Sure. Joe, can you maybe pick some up and so we can listen to them and see yeah. them in your hand? I right. think we'll that would be handy. Yeah. Okay. So here, it's a bit bit difficult. I feel like I've got a it is, tricky, it? <laughs> but so this is Nero Marquina, a black marble that I use a lot and is in the piece that's in the RSA mm -hmm. annual. That's very um, helpful to get a sense of the scale of them. Yeah. My I goodness, think, how, oh, how many of them ended up in that piece of work? Goodness thousands. God. Yeah, I didn't count it. So, but really <laughs> interestingly, so this, this is absolutely densely black, if you can see that. Mm -hmm. But then um, other pieces come and they, I don't know if you can see that, but that's got a lot of striation and graining in it. And um, for that actual piece for collect, I'll just turn this around and then. Oh, there you are. Um, for that actual piece for collect, I ordered lots of materials <laughs> in, and then I got this second lot, which was really white, almost like fat through meat, <laughs> striated, and was horrified because I was um, needing to make the work. And um, the company in Italy, pre-Brexit, I have to say, were fantastic. They just sent me some which arrived either the next day or the following day. How wonderful. So the natural quality of the material is really important. And I thought that might trip me up, but actually for people who want to go and have a look on the RSA website, um, you can see in the detail that I've used that striated material and it's it worked really well with the white gold leaf and has um, developed the work. So you can see here various uh, pieces of gold leaf mosaic from large scale 80 by 80 mil. Absolutely beautiful material. Sometimes it has a greeny blue background to it or colored glass over the top. Joe, but can I, I have a question yeah. here? Um, you see how it's gold on one side and blue on the other? Yeah. Which is the side that you would have showing in that? Or is it just that you have a choice? Yeah, I think 
well in fact that's tinted on this on the side on the front you could choose either side so this is 24 karat gold leaf wow yeah um and they've got the blue glass but you know it's absolutely beautiful on the back but so the silver is also white gold <laughs> so it's gold but it's um uh silver would oxidize so you can choose you know it's whatever you're whatever yeah. you're wanting to do this could I, is could i just say at this point um joe's going to be on for another five minutes or so and if anyone would like to ask a question and just type it into the chat um i will pass it on to joe and see if she can answer it so if there's okay. any if there's any questions just just um type away thank you sorry joe carry on um so I was just going to show everybody loves tools. So this is the traditional um, hammer and hardy. Is that in the picture? So it's a chisel stuck into a block of wood wow. and then a chisel ended hammer, which mine weighs just over a kilo. That's how I get the marble. And then that is what I cut it into <clears throat> so, um, with this. And you don't cut your fingers. So um, I'm just going to show you some of my drawings for the illumination, which are the um, wreath halo pieces. Ah, oh, yes. Here, um, here are some from Italy in one of the basilicas in Ravenna. Is that okay speed-wise? I'm trying. Yes, that's to absolutely move. fine. Um, Joe, yeah. could you? I've got someone here who says. Um, could Joe say more about the title of the piece and the concept in reference to Calvino? That's a very oh, good Oh, okay. Yes, that's lovely. Thank you for reminding me that. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, um, how to say this in a, in a very briefly. Um, I was awarded an Arts Council, Scottish Arts Council it was then, grant in 2010 to go and study in Northern Italy. Um, and um, so to study contemporary mosaic, um, which is when I came across architectural mosaic, but actually really importantly to my work, it's when I came across the um, Venetian architect, Carlo Scarpa, um, who used um, a lot of concrete, but also he used um, this just fabulous, these, um, this size mosaic in a lot of his uh, buildings. But I also was reading at that time um, Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities. Um, anyway. Uh, very briefly about Venice, but, you know, sort of it being an imagined place as well as a, a, a real place. And for me, uh, what I took from it um, was really about the beauty in the ordinary and um, um, the kind of the, the richness of what is there in these multi-layered cities. Mm. So my use of the title in visible cities as opposed to them being invisible so it's very much for me it's a hidden glimpse so as i walk down like a back street in venice i might catch up uh, or, or just see you know light on the water of a canal at the end of one of those little tiny narrow streets mm. that actually only goes to a boatway so um and things like that i find some things really speak to me so i will make notes or do drawings or take photographs mm. and then the process to get to these pieces and um which i could just turn that so you can just to let you know, um, I think we've had to tie up in about 30 seconds, Joe. So this, that is a beautiful shot to finish with. It's absolutely stunning. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're, they're all, all related. So that all the work, it's kind of an ongoing series. I feel that one piece influences the next, but yeah. they're very much about my response to being in a particular place at a particular time. Um, but also 
kind of what comes up in my imagination as well. Thank you, Joe. That's absolutely wonderful. There's look, some, there are people here say, hi, Joe, your studio looks great. Can you describe how concrete has become part of your material palette, especially in your recent 3D work? However, I think that you might want to type in, Joe, yeah. um, some of the answers to these in the chat, because I think you'll be able to see them. I and if you, that. that's okay. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. My um, pleasure. Uh, thank you, and that, and and we and stick around, and I'm sure you'll be typing away there. Uh, in the meantime, I would be delighted to welcome our next uh, artist, Jenny Pope. Hello, uh, Jenny. There you go. Hello. Hello. <laughs> How you. wonderful to see you. Um, Hello. Hello. Uh, Jenny, you've um, you've had a very successful time this last wee while with this relatively new body of assemblages and work. Um, mm -hmm. I've known your work for quite a while, but first of all, when I first met you, you were working on these large sculptures on the edge of water and in the land, but mm. there's been a, an amazing evolution into these sort of small and sometimes playful, but extremely thoughtful assemblages. Mm -hmm. And I, I love what you had in the SSA last year or the year before, I can't Thank remember. You. you won a prize. A years ago, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah I yeah, helped yeah. award that. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then you've got this beautiful piece. And um, without further ado, I would be delighted if you could um, lead us into your studio and tell us some more about your work. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Welcome to my studio in uh, Wasps in Albion Road, wherever you're from. Uh, this is in Edinburgh, right by um, Easter Road Stadium. Um, and what I'll do is I'll show you my space here. So this is my space at Albion Road. Ah, oh, you've got metal windows, reinforced yes. windows. <laughs> Not let anybody in. So this is my wall here with some objects on it and my uh, inspirational pictures here. Uh -huh. Come around slowly. This is my window looking out uh, and my new table that I've made. I need to move my chair out of the way. So these are my table of objects. Uh, these are what I've been making recently. You can see those. They, um, they, they all look very busy, like they should suddenly start moving at any mo at any moment, Jenny, you know? Like... <laughs> I am planning on animating them. That's the next. Oh, uh, how exciting. And then over here is one of my work tables. I use lots of different tools because I work with lots of different materials. I have lots of different tools that I use and I use lots of glue as well. I love working out glue. And then these are my maquettes at the moment. I'm making some objects move. So these are maquettes for making things uh, kinetic. Fantastic. And the scrubbing thing here. The noise is important for these things. Very much so. And then these are my units here. Are the gloves actually part of the artwork or are they protection? Well, both actually, these are um, maquettes for an installation that I'm working on at the moment for the end of May. Um, these are boxes of uh, objects, maybe you can see in here. Lots of budget, bo beautiful, yeah. beautiful, rusty things. Jenny, do you go beachcombing a lot? I do, yes, a lot, <laughs> yes, quite obsessively. I have for many years. Fantastic. Um, and lots of screws and fixing. Fixings are very important as well when using different materials. And then storage, we all need storage. I'm fascinated by the way that you and Joe have got in common that you, 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 it's, it's, it's artist studios, but it's also about the tools, isn't it? You know, that, that you know, things joining things and things gluing to things and yeah, it, it, yeah. yeah. Yes, materials are important and how you join them together is important. And for me, it's really important that the pieces look look good and they look like they function and there's not lots of glue and there's neat joints and they're, they're properly made. They're not just thrown together. There's, the aesthetic is about them being looking yeah. properly made and well-crafted. So that's important that I do that. Um, 
and as you said, I did used to make pieces. I started, I trained in ceramics and then I moved on and made things in concrete. And I just love materials. I love experimenting with materials. I used to put loads of different things in the kiln and fire it. And um, I've actually got my kiln still here under the table. Um, oh. And I've used concrete before and mixed media and textile. So I just love playing. I love materials. I love playing. I love trying things out and producing something which means something to me in terms of the ideas behind them. It's very important that my ideas come through in the work and I use different materials to um, best put across those ideas. Yeah. And so for the last couple of years, like you said, um, I've moved into making objects with uh, recycled and found things. And this is um, all based on ideas around change and the process of change and how people change and um, sort of psychological issues. I've when I'm not an artist, um, I have another um, career as a mental health worker. I've worked in lots of hospitals and um, now I do coaching and mentoring. So I'm very interested in conversations that people have and about all that, all the ways that we change. And so the tools are about psychological change and that sort of um, common human frailties and also um, common um, resilience that people have in terms of making changes and just the sort of the tension that we have around making change. So um, one of the tools I've made here is a creativity unblocker. Um, and this is a, supposed to be like a sort of trying to get something out of your head. Um, and this one here is a, is a panic button. That's a very powerful piece that. Yes, that. yes, yeah, yeah. So there, um, it's beautiful, Joe. I, I like the way, um, Jenny. I like the way that you you kind of respect all the gamut of emotions in your work that people might have. And often, yeah. I feel that your work, this recent work especially, does sometimes defines something that we didn't even know existed. And then when I've seen your sculpture, I go, Ah, oh, that's it. That's exactly what I need. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so there's a uh... I like this one as well. This is a lurking doubt comforter. Oh, <laughs> there's, there's just something I like. This is not about serious, the serious issues of mental health. This is more about our common frailties and our common anxieties. And, and as a society, we're hugely anxious. There's a lot of stuff going on that is quite stressful. And the last year has certainly shown that to us. But there's something about the way we can be resilient and, and look after ourselves that's really important. So while this is humorous and it is funny, um, I've got an everything's crap deflector and a bullshit cutter and um, they're, they are humorous, but there's also a serious side to them as well. Um, so this, this is one that I made, uh, it started off as an object um, that was stationary and I've now um, made it into a, um, an object that moves. Wow. Um, this is called an inertia massager. <sighs> I <And> need <laughs> something about lockdown that sort of, <laughs> we're almost a bit tired of a lockdown now, aren't we? We're sort of post we're pandemic fatigue. Um, so there's something about the way that this works and the sort of oh, creaky. Beautiful. Moves. That makes me so happy. Um, I'm just oh John John uh, John Ennis likes it. Ennis likes it a lot. I'm glad to say <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. Thank you, John. I like it a lot too. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm struggling at the moment to get to hit the deadline for my exhibition and I think I probably need one of those parked at the entrance to my studio and just uh, give it a little yes. turn you know just yes yeah you know, when yeah. you need wings to get to the end that mm. maybe you yeah, can make yeah. some wings perhaps yes just wings sound good yes yeah, yeah. And something about procrastination as well. I think there's these common uh, ways we trip ourselves up by procrastinating or, you know, almost getting in our own way. And I really like that way that we sort of trip ourselves up in the way that if we sort of think a bit differently or look, take a step back, we could actually stop doing that. Um, yeah, yeah. And I've got um, some, uh, I got a bursary from VACMA to start to um, make the pieces move now. So um, I'm getting mentoring from two artists um, to go through the whole process of kinetic sculpture and what that means, because it's a whole lot more difficult than I thought. Um, yeah. And it's absolutely fascinating. I love problem solving and I love the mechanics of it and the different ways to think about things. Um, That's my... so exciting, Jenny. I'm, I'm delighted that you're going in that direction. 
my sketchbook now looks more like a geometry book and oh, uh, proper maths going on there yeah maths yes yes <laughs> takes me back yes yeah yeah fantastic yeah, yeah. Well, Jenny, that I'm so excited. Um, although um, I, I can reassure everyone, um, in fact, perhaps, Sheena, you could dig up um, Jenny's work, um, a link to Jenny's work in the exhibition and put it onto the chat bar so people can click on that um, in, in your own time or during things. That would be fantastic. Um, but, but it's a shame that you can't share that image, but um, it's just brilliant actually seeing it and having a good rake in your studio is wonderful. And um, I just have a question. I've always been a huge fan of the work of Tangui um, mm. and Nikki de San Fal. Are, are they artists who, who you respond to? I'm just thinking of this, these abstract machines. Yes, yes, I do, I do. I really like the idea of sort of useless machines and machines that are sort of Heath Robinson type things that they're very complicated to do something which is sort of an easy function or an intangible function um, and that way we create this huge big machine things to actually do something quite simple yeah 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 I was just going to say yes that the piece uh, on, in the RSA exhibition is called Shelf Friends and that is these sort of partly um, Shelf anthropological Friends. shape Shelf Friends right and these are partly anthropological type figures, and I suppose it was during lockdown that I made them that I, you know, did feel quite lonely, really, away from my friends and, and people that I'm close to. So um, there was something about making these little figures that I had on the shelf, which, um, yeah, I think it showed something about connection and people and missing people, because I think I made these figures or made these things which looked like figures before I actually realised what I was doing. And then I thought, oh, that's <laughs> maybe that's why I'm doing that. They're very yeah. friendly looking, yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Jenny, Thank that's you. absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. If anyone would like to ask any questions in the chat, then Jenny can, I'm sure, um, type in <laughs> at her leisure. And, uh, and hopefully the link to your wonderful work in the exhibition should hopefully pop up soon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Thank so you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Now we would uh, just moving, staying in Edinburgh. Um, I would be delighted to welcome Duncan Robertson with a beard, no less. <laughs> yes, I've got a lockdown beard now. <laughs> yeah, it's very distinguished, Duncan, um, and welcome. And thank you so much for um, agreeing to come tonight to share your studio with us and talk a little bit about your extraordinary uh, un a last digital work but it looks very real and talk about the the possible realization of this enormous sculpture <laughs> well thanks very much kate um for those that you don't know me i'm duncan robertson the sculptor and i'm based down here at edinburgh sculpture workshop in the bill scott building bill scott um really had the idea for this new building we've got brand new um, sculpture studios and I'll give you a little look around my studio later on. Um, hopefully I can scream as she, oh gosh, where is it? Which one is it? Oh, I hope I picked the right one. So, um, so I thought first of all I'll show you quickly through uh, what I went brief look through uh, my work going back to why I use dresses and soft materials. Uh, this is one of the first soft works I made. Um, it's wax and jasmineite, and it's a dress coming out the wall like a big stain and like a flower. Mm. Uh, Duncan, what's jasmineite again? Uh, jasmineite is a kind of water-based resin. Um, it's, you use it with fiberglass material. It's a safe version of fiberglass. Um, jasmineite It's a water-based new hard material. Architects use it actually for outside buildings. It's very stable. Is that, uh, and it's is not it, as toxic as resin. Resin's very toxic. Uh, Joe, I think, Joe, you might have used um, jasmineite as well with your mosaics, possibly. Yes, I've always seen it as a, a kind of polymer concrete, but um, anyway. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, that's fine. No, I'm right. Anyway, that's been... Uh, <laughs> As a mere, as a mere painter, I can't. I don't know these things. <laughs> it's very expensive, but anyway, um, I use that as a stabilizer. But the idea came around um, when I studied in Germany. First of all, I went to Germany. I studied in the class of Eduardo Filozzi. I got a scholarship, and I stayed on. I went into the class of Asta Grutting. I became her Meister Schuler. Um, and this is about the time of my degree show and. 
Um, unfortunately, my mother died. Um, she died um, actually 53 is a year younger than I am now. I've outlived both my parents this year. Um, and I spent some time back in Perth and I had to clear the house. And you do as you do, sort of like giving the um, clothes away. And I gave it away to secondhand shops in Perth, you know, giving it away. And I just walked in one day and they had made a mannequin dress my mother's clothes. Oh my God, I didn't know that, Duncan. Oh. Uh, my mother was a working class woman, didn't have much money. She worked as a cleaner, but she spent a lot of time on her clothes. Like very specific, smart clothes from Marks and Spencer, and high collars, a very specific style. So if you tell it's my mother's clothes, that really felt well, shocking to me at the time, but also it made me think about how clothes and costume is something really relevant to an individual. And she still had her wedding dress in the um, wardrobe. And I thought, thought, well, I can just easily give it away to someone, like give it away as a um, present or uh, give it to a charity shop. And I thought, no, I've got to do something with it. So I made one of these dresses or dipped it into uh, wax and experimented with one of these um, forms. Um, this so in some ways it was a Patrick kind of homage. Was it, in some ways this started off as a kind of homage to your mother and the memory of your mother. So yeah, I did a, uh, a bit. And I was I experimenting at the time. I was actually working. I was in the second hand shops at the time looking for these little children's dresses. I was changing children's dresses into wax and then into uh, bronze. That was the work I was put. And this sort of was a development for it, doing it at a large scale. It did look quite ghostly, but I like the fact that it also looked a bit like a flower, like a stamen, you know, like a big sort of mm -hmm. like uh, tulip of a daffodil coming out or something. Absolutely, uh, yes. This was an exhibition I had in Patrick Hall, a solo show I had in Patrick Hall. Um, that was used on the Patrick Hall website for quite a few years, actually. If you Duncan, Google, what year was that? that? Because I don't oh, seem, I don't have a memory of that, and I should no. have done. Um, I'm quite shocked when I look at the dates of things, actually. It seems very recent to me, and things are going on. And this is another dress I made about this time. Um, this is looking back at 18th century hooped women's dresses. And about the same time my mother died, uh, there was a screening of the film, uh, The Tin Drum, uh, Black and Tommel by Gunther Grass. And there's a scene right at the beginning where um, the soldier hides underneath the skirts of this woman to escape the danger. And that really struck me as something poignant at the time. I really, I, I re I'm really struck by it. I thought I've got to do something, and this led to this work here. Um, and I was playing about with the idea of 18th century costume um, and dress and uh, made this wedding dress um, tent. And the idea that people would go into the dress here, um, but nobody did because it was quite uncomfortable to go in. Um, I was aware of Tracy Emmons. Um, tent that everyone I slept with, but I was I wasn't to do something sort of punky like that. I was trying to do something a bit more seductive um, with the work. But the problem was nobody went into but very rarely did anyone go in and see the interior. So I made a larger dress. So this is six meters tall. <laughs> this is Nimes in the south of uh, France. So head height's about this height here so you can walk in. And and Duncan just uh, just just to confirm this is not a digital image. This is an actual six oh, meter dress. Actual dress, yeah, it's um, absolutely beautiful. I, just, I've got, I was invited to the Nimes, I've been invited to Nimes Biennale three times actually, um, over a six year period. And this time, um, I had put a proposal in, and they had got them, they thought I was speaking, and um, because when I get sold them, it was six meters, they thought, oh, it must be 60 cent, cent, centimeters or something. They got <laughs> the wrong way around, I thought it couldn't be inches, and it must be. They gave me this tiny little space, and I was like, oh, I couldn't hang it there. And then he walked into the room and said, Will this do? Uh, yes, it'll do. Um, it survived actually, lots of public going through it because you had to go in and out of this room this bit, uh, this way um, with it. So people could go into the dress. Uh, oops, next slide should be an interior view of the uh, dress. This is inside the dress. There's a small mirror up the top there. You can look up and the dress sways. You get a little idea of uh, movement with the dress. I'm really interested in the idea that Bavaria and Munich was sculpture was huge monumental it was the biggest sculpture in the world before um they made the um liberty for um new york um that idea of going into uh, dresses 
And the ID address has moved on. I got a residency in Norway. Kate, you were on this residency as well at the same time. Um, and we got funding, which would give us some food and like two beers a week. And I really mean one on a Friday and one on a Saturday. I remember. <laughs> no money for materials. So um, what I did with my work there, I got a wedding dress that I cobbled together that I found in secondhand shops and round about the place. I made a wedding dress fit to me and I cycled around and found landscape and using a self timer camera, camera photographed myself in the landscape. And I used the flag of Norway as a sort of prompt to say where we were, it was sort of like a signal to where we were. And it resulted in this image. This is up in the Perkestorn, which is a preacher's rock uh, outside uh, Norway, uh, Stravanger. And it's literally a kilometre drop from that ledge down to the fjord below. And it's solid granite. And they always thought it was going to fall into the fjord. It does have a huge crack through the surface. Um, and it was December. So literally go up to take this photograph and come down again. Kate knows about this as well, because the first attempt at this, um, Kate went with me. We went up a little bit too late and we were getting some bad looks from people going up in the dark. And, uh, literally got up, got that photograph and got dark. But when I got there, I was so disappointed because it actually clouded over just as it got there. You usually see the huge size by the edge. Yeah, but Duncan, I think that makes, happen. that adds to the mystery. It does add to the mystery. I was very lucky to get yeah. uh, the yeah. photograph. Yeah, fantastic there. shot. Then I was whisked off to Australia. <coughs> I residency in Australia. And this, is, this was actually my accommodation, literally outside where I was staying. Okay. And... Duncan, we've got only a couple of minutes, so couple just minutes, okay, jump yeah. So this is just showing the air and uh, material. So you're saying, you're saying that the, it's really interesting because although there are no longer dresses in here, the concept of the material and the movement in the air is very powerful for yeah. all of them, and that relationship with fabric has been running through your work for for quite a long time now and yeah and jump through these and uh, to the point of embroidery kind of yeah. <laughs> yeah. of tattoos onto um fabric this is the work i've got in rsa i'm very lucky to get in RSA, really because it's just a digital sketch it's the idea of taking the uh forms from outside the huge Doric columns in the RSA building and bring them into uh, the building. So digitally reproducing the idea of something solid and making it soft within the building. Um, and these are installation shots of one of the dresses in South Leith Parish Church, which has got this wonderful ceiling, um, a copy of a church in uh, Leningrad. And what I think is great that RSA opened has managed to get in is this little um, image here, which I want to get in. It's a, one of these little moving images. And um, what I liked about having the dress there, it swayed a little bit with the cold and air in the place. It had this little feeling of a ghostly movement within the um, space yeah. because it moved. So it was nice to get a little moving image into the RSE open. So that's a good thing about being digital. Okay, let me finish my talk. Duncan, lovely. Um, Duncan, before you go, I, your studio looks so exciting. Could you stop sharing and just take your laptop around the studio oh. for us? Okay, now a very quick turn around your okay, studio. Real quick. Well, I'm not a minimalist, as you might see by my um, studio around here. Um, this is, can you see it around here? Yeah. So, um, it's back to front actually, you're looking the other way. Oh God, it was a bit disorientating. So this is a workplace. I have two workplaces. I have one that I keep for just drawing. And this is down here. I keep this for drawing mm -hmm. and sketching down this side. This bit in the middle I have is where I do my sort of assemblages, sort of like putting things together around right about here. So I've got my materials around here. And this side up here, you can see it back, it's used for I do fabric. And I keep all my fabric things on the shelves here. These are lots of found images that are waiting to be uh, worked on, manipulated on. So fantastic. It's, um, it's quite a big studio, but it's quite small for me. I feel a little bit 
time I could do with another one for storage. <laughs> so uh, that's a quick view of the studio. Maybe you should be great. Right. Duncan, that's wonderful. I have a very nice message from Denise Hidalgo who says, um, Duncan, I, well, she started saying, I loathe dresses and movement of cloth, but actually what she meant to say, she loves the dresses and okay. the movement of cloth. <laughs> it's very close to her heart. And it's very, it's just wonderful to know there's some amazing like-minded artists uh, out there. And just a big hello to you all. Thank you for coming. Duncan, that was brilliant. Thanks a million. Um, I'm going to close you down now, gently, and I'm <laughs> delighted to introduce Stephen Skrenka. Here he is. Hi, Stephen. Hi there. How are you doing? I'm very well. Thank you for being so patient. It's definitely... No, it's been enthralling. Last, but definitely not least. Um, Stephen, I, I hadn't met until last week when we had a little Zoom rehearsal, and um, I'm absolutely thrilled to meet you and I know that we'll meet in real life soon. I'll get over to Glasgow quite often. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> Stephen's work is a mixture of sculpture, assemblage, performance art, um, mechanics. I mean, I, you, you cover just about everything, I think. Um, the work you've actually got in the RSA is very beautiful poetic works, I would say, which are created with a combination of words, painting and planing. Is that, would that be the best? Yeah, that about sums it up, yeah. yeah. And, and the beautiful thing that you did was you created these works, which I'm sure you'll show, um, and then proceeded to give them away during lockdown. Is that right? Yes, I did, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. Um, I will, with, a, with no further ado, I will introduce you and let you take us to your studio. Well, you're already there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, welcome everyone to my studio. Um, this feels very strange because I'm always in here alone. Uh, and it's, it's my studio, it's my workshop, it's my library, it's my refuge, it's my laboratory. Uh, it's basically me. Um, I've been here a long time. I built this, I'm very, very lucky. It's in my garden. I built the studio 25 years ago. And this is where everything happens. It's about eight meters by four meters. And the way I work is, is, is no, no project is the same as the last one. So the space is constantly changing. Um, I think what, what, what I'll probably do is just give you a, a, a whistle stop tour around the studio. And then if you want, I can talk about the two pieces in the exhibition. That would be brilliant. So, so okay. Um, what I'll do is I'll just switch to da -da. there. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, I wasn't meant to show you that. <laughs> I had a terrible fire uh, oh two God. years ago. It was horrendous. Um, I lost quite a lot of tools and quite a lot of work, but I've come to realize it's quite a cleansing thing. And the, these windows are still to be replaced, but I think they're rather beautiful. Oh, That's okay. just, uh, you know, the carbon and the, uh, the, what the fireman left me but anyway um so yeah I'm, I'm just going to describe just as a sort of way of showing the the range of materials I work in I'm just going to tell you what each each thing sort of made of so um this is made from uh it's it's called depression glass which is it's it's glass from middle of the last century that was that was given away free in America and over here it was it was plentiful and it was to sort of cheer people up so I get these from charity shops and I put them in my kiln which is down here under my workbench and I sort of uh, flatten them in the kiln so I've kind of adopted this Daldevere process using concrete and, and glass um, oh. and it's a sort of it's a sort of impoverished way of working just from, from sort of uh, objects that, that are obtained either free or very cheaply, which is often how I work because, you know, as an artist, you just sort of um, work with what you can get hold of and you can't afford expensive materials. Uh, here are some glass paperweights uh, and I've been smashing them up. Wow, which that's it's, amazing. 
I was actually obs obsessed as a child with marbles. So instead of playing with marbles, I used to take a hammer to them because oh, I, I was I was absolutely desperate to get the the little coloured shapes out and completely utterly distraught when the whole thing would just turn into like white powder and chips. <laughs> but you know, Stephen, I felt exactly the same as a child. I think you've touched on a very tangible emotion of childhood of wanting to get at the colour in the middle. And I, I love the way that you've smashed them down and the colour still seems tantalisingly close, but still far away. There's something- Yeah, exactly, something yeah, there. yeah. And also the flowers look, for some reason, they look even more real. I know they're not real flowers, yeah. they're just like coloured glass. Well, they do, they're absolutely beautiful. Okay, so I'll, I'll just give you, I'll carry on with this little tour. Um, this is my worry stick, it's just a broom handle, so I just carve little notches in. Um, here's my tools which I kind of use, I use all of them really. They're not, they're not ornaments and I'm very, very proud of them. Uh, a lot of them are made in Glasgow by Alexander Matheson, which is, you know, in the 1890s was, was a factory just near the Barrowlands. These are my Norris planes that are made in London. Uh, um, is that, this is, are these some of the planes that you use to make I your... did, yes, I did. I kind of went through I, I didn't stick to one plane. I went through a lot of them. Um, now, what else have I got here? I've got bits of work lying around. I've been doing work with broken phone screens and filling in the cracks with oil paint. Oh, no. Uh, there's one here. Um, and I do, I do like to sort of court disaster with my work. So uh, down here I've got... This is actually two um, tabletops, toughened glass tabletops from a, a restaurant. They were chucking them out. And I've actually applied oil paint, sandwiched oil paint between them, and then smashed the front one with a hammer so it's exploded. But I had a few accidents with that because the back one exploded as well. Um, now, Using the same glass as the Del de Vere, I've been making stained glass panels, and you can see the sort of it's a sort of archaeology of everyday life, vases and bowls and plates that have been flattened in the kiln. Um, so what, Stephen, what is else? That, Stephen, is that glass the same as that one there? The same it's kind a, of glass. It's a, it's the same sort of depression glass, it's sometimes called carnival glass as well. Mm -hmm. I know. I always imagine sort of trifles and um, ice cream sundaes in it, that kind of thing. Aha, uh -huh. yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's Nobody that. seems to want them anymore, sadly. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you do. I, I like what <laughs> you do. Um, Steve, do you think you could move over and just show us a little bit about um, the work that you made for the exhibition? Because that will be yes. the work that people will see online. And as okay. time is marching on, I just... And, okay. And also, would that be okay? Yeah, sure. Um, oh, and, and don't forget about your plate. That's important. Okay, well, that's I'll, I'll show you the plate then now if you want. Yes, please. Yeah. Right. So the plate, okay, th th this is the plate that was in the exhibition. Um, I suppose before, I, I'm just going to quickly show you this plate because this, this is the plate that, that oh, influenced God. it. Oh, that's um, amazing. This was, I made this actually, it's a bit sad because my father was Ukrainian and he was born in 1921. So he was, he, you know, he survived the war. He was a refugee. He ended up in Muckles near Aberdeen and then went imagine. down to London, which, which is where he spent the rest of his life. But, you know, he survived Stalin's uh, famine. And he used to say to us that when the army came, they took everything and, and, and all they left them to eat were the plate table. So this is quite a personal piece. Oh gosh, yeah. Um, so. It's so powerful. In, in contrast, this is a happy piece. <laughs> so this, it's called 
gather ye rosebuds while ye may and it kind of I think it speaks for itself but it says a lot about my work process because it courts disaster trying to make it trying to cut these now I'm Just aware that you've them. got the phone in one hand, so please be careful. I would be so horrified if you were to break it in front of 144 <laughs> people who are all watching yeah. and holding, we're all <laughs> holding our breath, Stephen. You're making me laugh now, my hand's shaking. Okay, put it down. <laughs> I just show you the title on the back, which which was which is a really happy coincidence, it's, is is Rosebud. So for me, that refers to the Citizen Kane film and sums up, you know, childhood, pleasure, you know, um, innocence. And I think, you know, I think that's what art should be about. It shouldn't have an agenda. It should just be be of itself. Yeah. Oh, um, um, Chris, Chris Dolan has said, can Stephen tell us a little bit about his wall of death? Now, you're going to have to talk fairly fast Stephen but okay. um, first of all please show us your your plain strips with the okay. words on them if you may and then we'll hear a little okay. bit about okay well I'll, I'll sort of combine the two then um so at, at the start of lockdown I decided to um to build a wall of death in my shed here so I spent months and months and weeks and weeks making all the components laboriously um, and almost as a, a, a way of um, parrying that, I decided I'd do a sort of contemplative, sort of meditative thing every morning. I would come up with a phrase and I would paint it on a piece of wood and shave it off. And my challenge was to shave it off in, in one piece, one six long piece. So it was this, uh, this used to be uh, a windowsill. This is what's left of it. Uh, and my lovely partner, Alison, has let me borrow, this is one of them, because I gave them all away, remember? Um, Beautiful. So I'd come up with a phrase every day and I would spend maybe two or three hours painting it and then shave it off. And, and often it, it just didn't come out and I had to start all over again. So I had quite a few disasters, but... Uh, as time went on, I got a bit more ornate with my sign writing and a bit thinner with my wood shaving. So it was a kind of nice contemplative thing to do while building this mm. wall of death, which uh, outgrew my shed and is now, we're now building it in Barclay Curl down by the river. And I'm, I've been joined one by one by a team of uh, really amazing devoted volunteers. And today we... Uh, we put the last panel in, so the structure's all up. Wow, and, and what, tell me about a wall of death. I mean, I know it, you ride the wall of death on your motorbike, is that right? That's it, it's, it's, it's basically a giant wooden barrel, um, about uh, 16 foot high and about 28 foot wide. And it's long been my obsession because for me, it's quite a pure form of art. In, 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 you know, in my view, it's, it's, it's not a fairground attraction. It's a pure form of art because it deals with life and death head on. Um, it does. And, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Can, you, can you see yeah, me? I can indeed. Right, so it deals with life and death head on. And um, I think art should do that. And, and it sort of, it, 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 it deals with the boundary because usually, you're in a safe place in art when you do that. Mm. But this kind of bleeds that boundary because it actually is dangerous. So yeah. I'm kind of like trying to deal with that in my work. Mm. And also the wall of death is gonna be, it's gonna be used as a theater and a cinema as well. So it's gonna be like a, a, a creative space and a oh, wall of death on high days and holidays. Oh, Stephen, that's absolutely brilliant. I can't wait to come and see it. I actually- well, We're down at Barclay Curl on the Clyde, so you should come and visit. When, I will. I will. When we'll, allowed, we'll 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 be in touch. I I I have a very strong urge to create or curate an exhibition of all the artists I know who have, in their own way, dice with death simply because they have to, and it becomes a part of their work. And and like I've 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 got all these different 
artists coming to mind and I definitely want to include you. We just have to find a, the best place to do it. That's going to be well, amazing. Down by the Clyde. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> An alternative garden festival for the 21st century. <laughs> oh, bring it on. Yeah, wonderful. Anyway, I think we're just about run out of time. Um, I'd just okay. like to um, th um, thank you very, very much, Stephen. That was brilliant. I'd just like to say that I have a lovely message from Penny Herman Smith, who says, I've attended several webinars and seminars over the last few months. And I have to say that yours is the most stimulating, vital and creative and has left a great smile on my face. That is just the best comment ever. <laughs> um, thank you so much, everyone. I'd just like to, um, can we can we allow, are we not able to see everyone, are we? But please just give a round of applause to the artists. Fantastic. I'll just do it myself. <laughs> Have a look online at the exhibition and hopefully Fingers and toes crossed, we're all going to be back as soon as we can, and the RSA will be open for visitors. Fantastic. And can I just say a big thank you to Kate for chairing tonight's session, and a reminder that Open Studios number two will be on Tuesday the 20th of April. So do look back into that. Brilliant. And enjoy Brilliant. the rest of your evening, everybody, and thanks again to all our artists for tonight. Yeah.